This week I'm joined by David Webb, who is a professor of philosophy at Staffordshire University. He has published two books, Heidegger, Ethics and the Practice of Ontology, and Foucault's Archaeology, Science and Transformation. Most recently he has, alongside William Ross, translated a new edition of Michel Serre's The Birth of Physics. We will be discussing the work of Michel Serre. Serre was a French philosopher, theorist and writer. His works are notable for discussing subjects like death, angels and time. They are also noted for incorporating prose and multifaceted perspectives. Serre passed away earlier this year at the age of 88. Please enjoy. The first question is the Hermetics question. The uh, You can place three philosophers into a room, or three thinkers I should say, living or dead, and you get to sit in on the conversation. So which three do you pick and why? Right, well, uh, good question to begin. Now, I'm going to answer that. Uh, it's probably, a, this This may be too obvious, but one of the one of the philosophers is going to be Michel Serre, who we talked about this evening, okay? Um, uh, and obviously, uh, the, one of the reasons I pick Michel Serre is because I think he's a really interesting character, which is why we're talking about him tonight. The, um, the other two are Lucretius and... Leibniz and I picked them for various reasons partly because they both feature very strongly in in Serre's work and they're really important points of reference for him and so uh, it would be really interesting to put the three of them around a table and um, see see what they see what they had to talk about uh, but they would actually be very interesting people in themselves we know Lucretius who wrote De natura and the nature of the universe uh, is a uh, fascinating character. It's, a, an, it's an amazing book. Uh, but we actually know very little about him. So he appears to be a really interesting character mm-hmm. because of the work that he did, but we don't know very much about him. So that would be fun as well, to be able to, to learn a little bit about, uh, about the, uh, the person himself. Leibniz was an interesting character because he just did everything. I mean, he was interested in everything and wrote about everything, and he, uh, from science and mathematics to politics and all kinds, everything. So, uh, philosophy, theology. So, yeah, they're three really interesting characters, but Lucretius and Leibniz also have a particular connection to Serre, and so it'd be interesting to see how they are. Uh, how they connected, partly to see what Sam wanted to talk to them about, but it might also be interesting to see what they made <laughs> of some of the developments of yeah. their work that Sam had uh, uh, has performed himself. Yeah. Actually, yeah, you, you saying that makes me think of trying not to jump too quickly into the deep end, but, you know, Sam's notion of time in, in his conversations with Bruno Latour Yes, where you know his his notion of time is a crumpled handkerchief, which perhaps we'll extrapolate on later. So we'll leave it for now. But in that notion of time, he brings, you know, he says he says the ideas such as Lucretian atomism that now is sort of simply been renamed as non-linear dynamics now. Yeah. So almost them meeting would be like a, an instantiation of says time. So it's is it perhaps it wouldn't be so much as Sarah would see it as. A, Perhaps Lucretius would just be a bit frustrated. He'd say, "You know, I did make that. It isn't simply. It isn't simply. I'm stuck in time." <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, you're absolutely right. There would be. It, it would be a kind of instantiation of of uh, says thinking on on time. As much as, as you know, time for him is not a uh, a, a linear thing. Uh, it's we don't have any time stretching off into the past, through the present, off into the future, and. It's not uh, metric, which is to say we don't have its time is not a dimension that we can, we measure with standard units, uh, so that we can look back and say Lucretius was uh, two thousand years ago and Leibniz was whatever, whatever it is, sort of three hundred fifty years ago, four hundred years ago, and therefore one is that much further than the other, uh, because that's about measuring time, and to measure time you have to have standard units and standard kind of distances to spatialize it um, between one another whereas as as says, says um, if you think about times time in terms of uh, topology which he does and in terms of relations and dimensions then um, 
you can take that space, that line or whatever, however you like to think of it, and fold it up, as you say, like a crumpled handkerchief. And, uh, and all of a sudden, distance, um, points that seem to be very far removed are very close, like they would be sitting around a table having dinner together. I don't, I don't know the eating habits of Leibniz or, <laughs> or Lucretius, so I wonder, I wonder, I don't know if Lucretius had bought into any of the asceticism of the time, so maybe... Maybe. It's a good point. It's a good point. It's uh, Epicurean, so yeah, he wouldn't yeah. be. Uh, he probably would be uh, going easy on the port. Or, yeah. yeah, very critical of uh, <laughs> Sayer's notion of food as well. Yeah. Um, okay, but there's too many ways we can jump off there before we've even begun. Um, so yeah, your your um, you know to bring it back to kind of banal reality, your um, your first encounter with Sayer. You know, how did you encounter his work? Well. Um, I'd been working mainly um, PhD, post PhD in phenomenology, really, and uh, but I'd had a background in, in science and uh, from from earlier, and um, a friend of mine who was starting a new publishing company, academic an academic press, Clinaman Press, uh, wanted to publish a translation of Michel Serre's book, The Birth of Physics, as his first book, and asked if I would kind of edit it in the sense of just sort of adding some critical material and uh, an and introduction. And um, I didn't really know very much about uh, Serre at all, really. I had come across him, one or two people when I was a graduate student, one or two were interested in, in, in Sayre and working on Sayre. Uh, Alan Murray, the guy in particular, I remember. Uh, but I didn't really know anything about him. And uh, so I just said, yeah, that sounds very interesting. And I started working on the book. Ended up having to do a certain amount of translation for it too. Uh, and absolutely fell in love with it. Just completely fell in love with this book and with Sayre's thinking. And that that was it, really. From that point on, I just wanted to read more and more. We shall say. I mean, as you know, as I as I emailed you after after the after the course that that you know you instructed on, say, you know, I, I emailed you specifically about uh, the birth of physics and said, you know, that had a serious effect on me because occasion, occasionally, I guess in quite a quite a somber way, your occasionally your philosophical flame. For, you know, it it dampens occasionally, but then every now and again, you every every few years or so, you come across a text that completely is like a complete reminder as to why this uh, works for you. And that was, but there's a, I just thought there on the spot actually is an interesting question because you you translated Sir uh, initially when you didn't really know much about him, and then recently, so 2018, you finished the new translation, full translation, yes, of Birth of Physics. Yeah. Do you think then between those two? that someone, I mean, this isn't particularly related to Sarah, but I think it's, it's an interesting thing that I can now ask in this unique setting, um, that someone can actually translate the work that they don't fully mm, grasp. No, it's, it's a very good question. It's a very good question, and I think it's really difficult, um, very difficult to do that. Uh, and it's, um, it's difficult to do that, and it's really difficult to do that well. You can do it. I've, I've, I've done a fair amount of philosophy translation in the past, uh, and it has always been around things that I've known, um, but one or two cases, just small things. One thing that you can do as a translator is you build up certain kind of a certain kind of awareness, a certain antenna for where problems might lie, <laughs> and you, that helps you get through things because you can start to spot where you need to um, look a little bit more carefully and to find out a bit more. Uh, so that gets you through a few things, but the the problem is that you're, they're not, it's not fail safe, it's not perfect, and you're bound to miss things and just not quite get the uh, particular resonance, a particular of a word, a particular, particular connotations, or, or, or often just the voice of someone just don't maybe quite get it. So it's not ideal to, to uh, by any means to tackle a translation without really knowing the work uh, and the author mm. well. And Sarah so, is certainly a, uh, a very unique voice to click into. 
I can't really, I can't really describe it. It's a strange mixture of things I imagine we'll dip into. But so perhaps, perhaps we should head into his work now. Mm. Um, and I think as we've been discussing it, it's one of his earlier works. Uh, it's a work I imagine that you, you know, it's where you begun. It's where um, it's not where I begun, um, but it's where where you begun. The birth of physics. Um, yeah. So this is a, a book of philosophy of science with regard to a sort of if you were to describe it very basically it would be a uh, contemporary continental reading of lucretian atomism yeah that's perfectly well put it is exactly that it's a con- con- very it's a contemporary this re-reading or almost kind of recomposition <laughs> of of uh of lucretius but there is one crucial thing that it does in addition to simply being a reading of Lucretius from something that we might call a kind of contemporary setting crucially what it does is say okay um, Lucretius has been treated for the most part as a um, as a poet and as someone who wrote um, some lovely but slightly vague uh, speculative things about the nature of the universe and um, we don't really have to take him that seriously as, as a rigorous thinker because it is a little bit vague and uh, after all he was writing in verse so he's a poet really not a scientist right mm. what Sayre does rather brilliantly as you know is to say all right well look what is he talking about and he's talking about uh, he's talking about things that look like kind of infinitesimals and he's talking about equilibrium and he's talking about deviation and he's talking about all these kinds of things he says well what we if we were to make this into a really rigorous scientific uh, account what would we need well we'd need a we need a mathematical account of all these things wouldn't we right uh, where could we find something like that and of course he finds it actually in archimedes and so says contemporary reading is contemporary in the sense that it's informed by lots of lots of things which are going on today no doubt but um it's in a way it's not uniquely contemporary because what he's doing is actually putting two ancient sources together <laughs> And out of that, producing something which then looks incredibly contemporary, because as you say, it's it's uh, all of this non-linear, non-linear dynamics and, um, and a work that looks very much like complexity uh, begins to fall out. Uh, but it's it's kind of right there on the surface. It's hard to miss. Which makes me makes me kind of wonder, you know, you've got these two ancient sources. I wonder what if we could pinpoint then the is the contemporary aspect the fact that he, you know, it is this bringing together, which is something said as a lot actually, kind of continuously brings smaller smaller parts together, and it forms something yeah. that you could consider a whole, but it's um, very much a vibrating whole. You know, it's not it's not a kind of a you know a unified thing. It's yeah. you know a whole of flux um you know i think one of the things that needs to be touched on in terms of specifics of the birth of physics is um the, the cleaner um which you know that's perhaps you could describe it better than me but it's kind of the source of all of everything really is i can't i've yet to go beyond anything than the cleaner which you know you, you can't get beyond the cleaner man yeah well th- let me just uh rehearse briefly the, the the stages that Lucretius sets out in the emergence the emergence of order uh, in the whole universe and it, it begins with this probably imagined state uh, of all the atoms the infinite atoms in the universe raining down in parallel lines at equal speed so it's just this there's actually an image of what is at once got a perfect order and no order at all really um and as long as things remained that way there would be nothing there would be nothing that we would recognize as order of any kind any anything in the world any system or anything at all 
But so what happens? Well, uh, because, of course, Lucretius is describing a a universe here which is which is uncreated with no creator, God or demiurge or or, or anything of the kind. Um, But neither is it in in a kind of Aristotelian sense, a a stable, fixed universe with an eternal uh, uh, order to it. It's a it's a universe of flux, flow, becoming, albeit an eternal one. But it begins with this begins uh, this kind of first imagined state as if the atom is raining down this way, and then it is well for something to happen, for there to be anything at all. There must be combinations of the atoms, therefore they must collide in some way. Therefore there must be a deviation in the path of these atoms. And so there is this spontaneous event, which uh, is called the clinament or declination or just inclination which he in which he says that an atom will just deviate just the tiniest amount from its from its path just enough for you to be able to say that there was a change in its motion and it happened spontaneously uh, without us being able to say where or when that's that's going to happen and it's an uncaused event and uh, from that of course then more collisions occur and uh, you end up very quickly with turbulent motion, completely chaotic turbulent motion, which then becomes, uh, begins to form order like you see a smoke billowing around a room or something, you start to then to see vortices or whirls form. And that, uh, says uh, Lucretius and Sayre, is the beginning of the order that we see in the sense that that already is is repetition not not perfect repetition but repetition regularity and therefore a form of order and the world that we see is actually a a, a fluid world he says even even apparently solid objects are just slow moving fluids um, <laughs> Because we're all in this kind of flux, which gradually repeats itself in the sense that it has an order to it and it sustains itself and holds itself together. But that eventually will break down, like patterns of of vortical movement in in water or or smoke. Um, And um, as that happens, then the material that we're made of, that the world is made of, will flow back into a, a wider universe and um, spin off and then eventually collide somewhere else and form some other world in, in another part. And so you, what you then have from this uh, idea is that uh, atomism, atomism isn't really about little bits of matter behaving in mechanical ways. It's actually about f- flow. It's about dynamics and it's, it's about complex patterns of flow. And we get the idea that, uh, that the forms of order that we can see and Lucretius was thinking about the world that he could see around him is not necessarily a good indication of forms of order that may exist elsewhere so there are no universal laws no universal laws even that determine how the atoms will move and what happens when they fly there are just local forms of order which have emerged out of these this chaotic um, uh, movement so you have a very interesting idea, which is actually, uh, well, I have lots of interesting ideas, but, but one uh, really interesting idea which comes out of this, which is now beginning to come back into people's thinking in a scientific context, is that causation precedes law. Because traditionally speaking, and if you look at almost every account of causality that you can find uh, in, in philosophy and philosophy of science, uh, one in one way or another, it is just simply assumed that that one thing causing another, that the motion, the the impact, or whatever, that all of this happens according to laws which pre-exist the event, and um, those are the laws that that classical physics has always tried to try to find and there would be universal laws and so whatever you determine is happening here once you understand how it works that's going to be true for events of a similar kind anywhere in the universe at any time of its history uh, and now we begin to realize that's not necessarily the case and, and actually the the account of uh, of law 
kind of goes hand in hand with causation, and, and so the the it's, it's a much different way of thinking about it. Um, but it's already there in Lucretius, and it's one of the things that that Sarah takes from this, and um, that actually becomes a very important part of his thinking. So you know, bear with me just a moment. <laughs> sorry, a moment longer about the answer. So the one of the things that's a kind of feature of Sarah's thinking, I, I, I believe, is that. We find an idea like this, which we can then begin to see in uh, in, in, in some areas of, of contemporary science and cosmology, for example, today. And Sarah has spun this idea out of reading Lucretius and Archimedes and ancient texts, okay, and Leibniz as well. That's already very interesting, but then it becomes a kind of feature of Sarah's thinking in in other ways and so it's not restricted to just talking about cosmology or just talking about a particular problem in in, in this region in this region or that region of, of, of contemporary thinking it becomes uh, part of the way that he thinks generally and so all of a sudden that that one idea starts kind of migrating and having different effects in different places as it um, as it moves through the ways he thinks about the history or society or time or and so on and so on. Yeah, that's a extremely, extremely clear answer. I mean, I'll touch or, or we can kind of almost carve a path now I think about it, a very vague one from the ways in which he, he begins to utilise that, especially in his um, his work, his kind of, you know, what, what you called middle works, but we said we're, we're not going to focus on a, on a linear path to say. But one thing I, I noticed about birth of physics, which for a philosophical work of science, it's, it, you know, when, when we talk of um, these vortices and these, these kind of trembling momentary existences, which is, which is the solid material reality we have, that's all it is, is kind of this temporary trembling, um, you know, whirlwind of atoms. Um, and, and, you know, Sir makes it clear that all of these, you know, return return back to um, the plane of atoms, of parallel atoms, you know, back to begin this process again. But it never once, from my memory of reading it, comes across anything even close to pessimistic for Sarah. There's no, um, not even a hint of an idea that you could drag from this any moralism, you know. There's no, it's, it's an extremely matter of fact um, without even coming across as, you know, so many people would write of such an existence and it would come across as sort of like, a, you know, Colonel Kurtz, the horror, the horror, you know, <laughs> everything returns, everything returns yeah. to, you know, everything's entropy. Um, but for Sarah, I think maybe, maybe we should bring in just a tiny bit of biographical information, which is that the fact that he fought in, in um, well, he was in the services for a long time and he saw, um, was it Hiroshima? What yeah, he was. He, he, he would have been a boy at the time, really. He would have been about. He was a teenager um, at, at, at the time of uh, Hiroshima. He was born in 1930, so he was too late to actually be on active service in, in the Second World War. But he was. Yeah, he he was very aware of it. He 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 knew about this. He must have seen it on early newsreels or something, and he read about it. And that event, he has said, is burned into every page that he's ever written. Wow. He's put it that strongly. Where does he say that? Um, now you uh, yes, it's, now you say that. I'm, I'm going to struggle to remember. <laughs> um, I can't remember. Okay. I can't remember where he says that. Um, I'm sure that's no. quite an easy one yeah. to find on Google. So he's, it's, it's a major, major event for him. Uh, and much of his work is about violence and ways of avoiding violence ways of, sort of ameliorating violence uh, and, and um, the birth of physics is too uh, in a way really I mean the, 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 partly it's, it's, it's very obviously uh, about, about violence and avoiding violence in as much as the text by Lucretius is dedicated to Venus God of Love and speaks, refers very often to Mars, God of War, and of Venus kind of taming and overcoming Mars. Uh, so there's this 
the, the, the Lucretius, Lucretius's text is about the possibility of um, of overcoming violence through through love through peaceable means. But uh, it's not at all a kind of uh, let's all just try and stop being horrible to each other. That's not the that's not the idea. Uh, because Venus becomes a, a figure uh, in a way that there are many many figures in in Sayre's thought that that stand for something. They're kind of like almost kind of operators of his thinking. Uh, and Venus is about. Uh, love, which is about combination, which is about conjunction, uh, which is about coming together, and this is this is what atomism is all about. Because of course, order only emerges through the conjunction uh, of of atoms. So that Venus is a kind of figure for that material process itself, and. Lucretius describes there being two ways of thinking about law, and this comes back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, actually. One is of Mars, the, the, the kind of violent law, uh, and, and one is of Venus, which is the law which emerges out of these conjunctions, out of these combinations, which is then precisely this kind of law of, of um, emergent regularities that, that comes from that material process. So uh, there's that sense in which even that book, The Birth of Physics, is really about, it's kind of about peace and, and it's about peace and love, even though Sarah's <laughs> really no hippie as well, <laughs> by any stretch. Um, it's even about understanding, it probably is, yes. The, uh, the, uh, <laughs> but there's another sense in which there's a kind of non-violence in that book, which I think is actually much then closer to the kind of real spirit of, of what says doing in, his, in a lot of his thinking and that's if we th the violence uh, and death in that book it comes from entropy it comes from everything unraveling it comes from disorder just uh, sweeping through and everything he say, says following um, Lucretius but also Leibniz everything is on a downward path everything is on a downward spiral towards entropic dissolution disorder uh, including ourselves so uh, the violence here is uh, would actually be to uh, to accelerate that descent it's actually to hurtle quicker towards dissolution and and um, disorder uh, and it's it's kind of an Im it's an image which is very strong in Lucretius's book because the final the final book of the six books in, in Lucretius's text uh, is a graphic account of the uh, plague in Athens sort of death and decay in the streets and just a kind of nightmarish vision of um, the great civilization of Athens being overcome by death destruction plague and decay and so on how does this what does Lucretius but what does say in particular say in response to this well the Epicurean principle of, uh, for well-being is ataraxy uh, that of uh, that of a kind of calm peaceable condition with minimal disturbance uh, but in a dynamic context of flux and spiraling down paths towards disorder I mean how, how is that supposed to happen and uh, the point that Sarah emphasizes is that equilibrium is never perfect but insofar as there is something a bit like equilibrium that kind of, uh, something kind of holds together and sustains itself for a period of time it's dynamic it uh, things flow in there's a pattern of order which is kind of repeated but never perfectly and it also matter flows off uh, so you could say that it kind of receives and holds holds itself together but also transmits you could put it that way as well in terms of communication that we might speak of uh, and the kind of sense of peace is by sustaining that by finding ways to to uh to incorporate what comes to us to hold it together to hold ourselves together to regulate a kind of pattern of flow for a period of time that kind of that 
holds us a little bit to slows down that descent than to to uh, to death and destruction which we are all nevertheless on and that's that that is the kind of anti-violence in it is that and it's how does that happen and how how does that hold together how do things hold together and different ways in which that can can occur which are both through material in a material sense when one looks at how atoms behave or whatever and how system physical systems behave but also in a in different senses if one looks at it in terms of society and history creativity making things culture this is these are all ways in which we practice slowing down the um, descent for for Sarah and in that sense they're all uh, they're all connected in a certain way to his concern to reduce violence Mm. I think you know we slid in there into one of the 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 big big themes for Sarah which is which is communication which I think inherently there's a connection there to Violence, because you know, I imagine for say that a means to maintain these forms of you know equilibrium, but for say they're kind of just just kind of they're disequilibrium, but the worst kind of disequilibrium, so close to equilibrium, but you can't, you know, I don't think as you you mentioned to me once before, I don't think Sarah would, uh, you know, Sarah's not happy with any kind of what we'd consider a complete subject for the human, so I can't imagine he'd ever agree to something as you know this is equilibrium this is done sure. like there's no such thing um yeah. but for the communication you know that that's probably a means for her to maintain these forms of you know as close to equilibrium um but with regards to communication I, i'm you know in in good old radical fashion begin with his most one of his most kind of controversial statements with regards to communication, which was simply that communication was greater than production. Uh, yeah. And this was a kind of thumbing the nose at the the Freud Mark superhighway, I believe, which is what he, yeah. he named it, which this brings together a lot of elements for Sarah and also a bit of the biographical stuff, the fact that, you know, during the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, when, you know, the majority of French continental French philosophy was going the Freud Marx route. He was going the cybernetics and information theory route, but he wasn't doing that purely. You know, yeah. he, he, there was a uh, combinations of philosophy of science, of course. So yeah. you know, um, and uh, I don't know how what what you say his reading of history, what what kind of form that takes. Um, but yeah, let's uh, begin from communications greater than production, because I think there's a lot in that, but I'm, yeah, I, I'm not too sure what direction that's intended to head. Yeah, <laughs> it's, um, you're absolutely right that I think he, he, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't know, because I've not spoken directly with anybody who could kind of verify this but it i think he would have taken some pleasure in in being kind of contrarian uh, at that point and and um if you look at his his history of uh things he's been interested in and places that the ways you could begin to try to situate him uh, which is actually very difficult. You find he's kind of associated with a lot of different areas, but always steps away, always kind of is um, not actually uh, easily part of anything. And so I, he would have, I think, seen that the dominance of those discourses around him and probably in, in part taking great pleasure in, in disagreeing and, and placing himself somewhere else. But that, that doesn't say tell us anything kind of philosophical about about the uh, about the remarks the one way to, I think to 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 think about this idea that communication is here's a couple of ways to think about it which I think both of which I think are important uh, one is that he got a sense quite early uh, through his uh, reading of cybernetic studies and information theory and, uh, and stuff that uh, the information and communication was going to be absolutely massive for determining 
shape of society, who we are, how it functions, and everything else. Right? And so, in a sense, this was a, this was a kind of a, a Vol's projection, uh, a Vol punt on his part, and say, look, everybody, you're all talking about production, you're all kind of completely obsessed with various interpretations of Marx here, but I'm telling you, actually, it's we're all we're all heading somewhere else, where these other questions to do with information technology and communication are going to become massive so i'm sure that was part of it and um it's it, i mean I, I, you know, marx remains and marxist analysis and production uh, remains absolutely crucial to what's happening to us today socially but he was say was certainly right about the fact that communication was going to become an enormously important uh question the other aspect of this which i think which i think comes in in a different sort of way is that uh one of the things that Sarah does is identify certain kinds of uh process so we say um and then not not generalize them because that suggests the certain kind of uniformity uh is then sort of washed across all the examples that you're looking at but uh repeats them kind of multiplies them in certain ways and communication is uh, maybe a maybe he saw communication as as a having further kind of reach if you like uh, in this respect in this respect than production which obviously as we know through if we if we take it in a, in a Marxist way, it has a has a very particular sense and context and setting. Whereas uh, when Sayer talks about communication, he's talking about every single brute thing in the universe, including in ourselves, but not and only by any stretch. Uh, so he's talking about the exchange of information between um, rocks and crystals and the sun and water. And, trees and animals and everything else, everything communicates. Um, and yes, I, I, I think I can imagine someone very quickly saying, yeah, but everything produces. And so you could then kind of you could look at ways in which production is, uh, is you could that you could speak about production in, a, in perhaps in a similar way, but, but communication is the way that he does that. And, and in that respect, then it becomes a, an idea which allows him to travel you know, because one of the things that as, as, a, as you know about his his work is that uh, he um, he connects things his thinking is very much about movement and connection and um, if you have different ways of thinking about communication when you think about the the, the the physical world, the the world of um, life broadly broadly taken, should we say, and, and then about uh, about social forms of life and, and so on. There are many many different ways in which you can you can understand what communication is, but you can move between them. And that sense, he's understanding communication as a key idea here, and then allows him to extend his thinking through all of these different contexts and to find ways in which they're connected because it's not always the same communication that's happening in the same way so it requires thinking to figure out what the connections uh, are and how one moves from one from one to another with with this with communication it's it's um it's one of those difficult moments with say where i've i've kind of realized you know there's 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 kind of three or four interacting um, moments of his and you think which one should I have put first so that you can kind of yeah constructively build up the rest but they yeah. they, they work you know as a multiplicity or work they uh, they're working off one another so it's quite difficult because I'm thinking you know with with communication comes in you know says notions of noise and silence with regard to kind of information which is yeah. you know it's just, uh, is also related it's also in exactly the same vein as that prophetic nature with regards to kind of saying you know him saying there's going to be this big mass of you know, communication over production but that you know I think within that he probably already saw well hang on from this 
Mm. There's, there's going to be noise. There's going to be, you know, there's going to be... You know, what happens to silence within a world wherein communication overtake, you know, becomes greater yeah. than production? Um, so I think, you know, noise is perhaps something that we should kind of... Noise for Sarah, of course, um, and how he sees it or he, hears it. Uh, yeah. is something I think we should extrapolate on here. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, it's a good point. Noise is a is a is a um, important theme, and, and uh, as you say, it's one which comes out of his reading of information theory, and uh, he he just takes this as this is already worked out in, in information theory. He takes this idea that there's there is no communication without noise, uh, and um, because for, the, for, a communi- for communication to take place, there has to be a code, the, which is kind of shared between two, two as a receiver and a transmitter and receiver, two people or whatever it may be. And for there to be a code, there has to be something excluded. And as soon as you start talking about that kind of exclusion, you've got noise. Uh, it, there's something that's going to be going along with that communication which is uh, surplus to it which is uh, interrupting it in some way and noise so you've got there immediately various kind of really important kind of features of his thinking which he he develops such as the um the idea of uh exclusion and uh and the idea of uh, the parasite which is the name of one of his most well-known books uh which where the parasite is kind of noise uh, it's, it's the one who kind of interrupts the, uh, the communication um, causes it to break down in some way so you've got that, that idea of noise which is kind of intrinsic to communication which also is, is, is a disturbance to communication but it's also in addition the point at which um, uh, points of, from which new sense can actually emerge because if we only ever had communications which were absolutely 100% completely transparent in every respect and perfect then um, I think Seth feels that we'd get bored very <laughs> very very quickly it's there's a kind of sterility to that nothing very interesting would happen they would uh, we'd, we'd lose the uh, inventiveness of our communication which depends in in large part on the noise that comes with uh, with communication so you've got all that and and again from that just information theory then those that ideas of noise you start getting him he he develops that in books like parasite also books like genesis where he talks about the emergence of order in particular and in particular of time um where he talks about it there in the context of art as well and uh, of literature so again he's taking these things and and finding that they operate elsewhere so you take an idea from information theory and he, and he kind of finds it operates just as well when you think about it in a completely different context and that, that allows that sense of kind of travel that, uh, that i mentioned which is characteristic of his thinking but but noise you were saying in particular about how that kind of mass of communication begins to overwhelm us and that becomes a really important part of his his later thinking in particular where he says there's uh and, and, it, and he does talk about he does talk about production here we, we we produce and we produce things and in producing things we uh we cause a lot of pollution now um in fact he he then argues that pollution like that isn't which ends up getting dumped in landfills and then dumped in dumped in the sea or you know wherever it gets and ends up is not uh, some unwelcome byproduct of the production process it's actually a fundamental part of what living beings do that they make a mess <laughs> they create filth and it's by creating filth and then dumping it uh, that they mark their territory so it's about possession it's about appropriation and uh, we have filled the earth with this filth that we make 
uh, from hard things that we make from industry, industry and uh, nuclear power or whatever uh, as a way of owning it, as a way of staking our, our claim to it. But in addition, we've filled it with, with a kind of soft muck as well with with signs and language and uh over a uh, kind of overproduction of um of language yeah this is there's various books where he says you can't go or imagine anywhere in life that in on the earth which hasn't in some way been already kind of colonized by signs language and something which is already um uh, touched by this, and um, that's again another kind of um, another kind of it's another kind of noise, uh, but one which he here is very simple. It's, 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 it, he really believes very much that we need to find ways of um, being less noisy. Yeah, that's sort of a parasitic form of noise, though, because you know, uh, as he says, you know, there's no way you can go where um, you know you're not you're not being taken under, you know drowned in this noise but you i imagine people would idyllically think of kind of well, what about what about the amazon rainforest but even then one would realize that the the kind of parasitic nature of noise is you're, you'd still be kind of rotating noise which has got into you you know your thought processes and your you know so um, there's <laughs> that's um but again that when he mentions these things i mean that's one of the times when it does occasionally come across as almost like sad but he doesn't i don't think he yearns for anything there isn't a sense of mm. withdrawal back to i mean he he sort of tongue-in-cheek flirts with rural traditions occasionally but not mm. in any serious manner i don't think i think he just has a kind of fondness for them i don't i'm not sure there's any real callback for tradition there you know saying oh we should have we should kind of reduce the noise or you know, and I think perhaps this is a good time to introduce another <laughs> another concept because they all do kind of intertwine, um, which is the what you know the, the the helmsman, which is we can kind of uh, I'm hoping we can kind of utilize this, which say it kind of does as a means, because we've brought in all these 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 ideas, but the, uh, thus thus far. There's nothing in the in says you know it's not the greatest way to talk about it because it's a bit too, it's a bit of a utility, but his toolbox you know there's nothing here to kind of um, react with or you know navigate through these things they're just here thus far so perhaps the helmsman this will be our yeah. you know, sigh of relief for people trying to say well okay, <laughs> what, these, to what, what am i going to do in this <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd um I'd, i wouldn't be too quick i mean just to go back to something you said we mm -hmm. we'll get to the helmsman very very soon but just to go back uh, to something you said there james um uh I agree that he does flirt a little bit with kind of rural kind of uh, images and, and going back. But I think that is just a kind of, um, there's a certain, um, there are certain uh, kind of attachments he has to to rural life and in particular rural life uh, in southwest France where he, where he grew up. Uh, but there's also an awful lot of, there are many occasions where he has a really, very direct, shall we say, criticism about the kind of life that was going on there. So he's not a kind of, um, he doesn't look back with rose tinted uh, glasses, really, uh, at all. I agree, I, I agree about that. He's, um, but I do think that, that he's, he has a concern for life. And, and as he says, life can only uh, emerge and flourish in spaces and it's in the spaces left by other by other things and so there's a there is a sense of, i think for him in which we are rapidly killing the planet and actually that's not a good thing <laughs> but we have to <laughs> this you know sounds, say that sounds sounds it sounds trite to, to say it but um the the processes I've described of kind of over production of, of, of language of signs and of the of, of, of the mess that comes with our uh, kind of hard forms of 
production are um, they, they filled the earth to such, a, to such an extent that uh, that life is being extinguished and um, yeah he I, I think he wants to find he wants to talk about ways to stop that ways to ways to avoid that uh, some of these kind of come back to then to the up to the your your point about the helmsman. The um, there's an image which he uses, which is sort of which is, goes on from what I was just saying, uh, follows on from what I was just saying. There's an image which he uses of, of uh, the ship quite often, right? um, as, as you know. And there's a one way of kind of maintaining order and and keeping things in, in decent shape on a ship is simply to chuckle the rubbish overboard. Right. It's just to, is to uh, throw all your waste or whatever kind it may be uh, over the side, and um, that's fine uh, if if you like. But as, as he says, we the Earth is the ship now. We've got nowhere to chuck it <laughs> because there's nowhere else to, for it to go. So we have we we don't have that option and another way he describes this is to say that uh, that the figure of the figure of the of the um the captain in a sense on a ship but also it's a figure of the ruler the leader which you can pick up from uh, from classical literature and so on as well is the figure of a of someone who can retreat to somewhere who has somewhere to go back to their cabin back to their tent, back to their court or whatever it might be, so that they are retreat from the world in order then to be able to plan and figure out what the uh, appropriate course of action will be that they uh, they, uh, exercise next on the world. But he says, we don't, on ship, actually, you you don't have that luxury, really. Uh, You don't have that luxury, and you, everybody's on the ship, that's your limit of your world nowhere to go back to and so he introduces a different figure for the for the ruler which is that of the uh, the helmsman and the interesting one of the interesting things about the figure of the helmsman I think is that he the helmsman sort of hanging onto the the the, the rudder the steering oar or, or whatever or the wheel uh, is in direct communication with the forces that bear on the ship the wind and the uh, and the and the currents and so on and uh, can only set a course to the extent the metaphor by negotiating with those forces and there is even a kind of certain feedback uh, going on there, and as much as the the decisions and actions that the 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 helmsman takes in terms of perhaps the sails that are used, but uh, says images usually of the the oar and the water and how it's manipulated, uh, creates its own. Feedback it has a sort of it has an effect on the water, which which has an effect on it, and and, and so on. And there's, so you've got that very direct, but also potentially complex uh, communication with with the forces which bear on the ship and its course and survival. And the um, the reason that that image of the helmsman then becomes really important for him is he says, look, uh, we have become accustomed to the figure of the uh, of the political leader the king or whoever being someone who governs over a kingdom a society a republic a city whatever right? uh, over over a social space and actually they don't really need to know anything about stuff which happens in in the natural world but we don't have that luxury any longer because there's nowhere there's no sort of outside left for us we 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 are up against the elements we are up against the conditions of 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 life as they exist around us and as we are changing them and therefore the ruler the 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 figure of the helmsman in in, in, taken in a political sense has to be in connection with the elements with the world outside and not just with the uh, 
social forces. So it's it, the helmsman, in a sense, is the uh, is is Sayre's updated image of the prince, uh, of Machiavelli's prince. What are you just thinking? Can I just add something else? One of the things which I think is really interesting about this as well is that the uh, it the figure of the helmsman is one who has to negotiate a complex world, right? A complex uh, and unpredictable world, and um, there's uh, there's a parallel, I think, with the figure from the important figure in 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 uh, classical ethics and, and political philosophy, and in particular in in Aristotle, was a parallel with the idea of the uh, the. Aristotle calls him the phronimos, the figure who uh, who knows how to function well in a in a complex political and ethical environment. Um, mm-hmm. And our, for Aristotle, that's a very particular kind of ability because uh, there are no rules for how you're supposed to do it because there can't be rules for how you're supposed to do it because the, no two situations are ever identical. It is a, uh, you don't know the consequences of the actions exactly how what they're going to be um, you've never been in a situation where people are challenging you in certain ways or expecting certain things of you or, or, or whatever every situation is a little different and therefore it requires a very particular capacity to function uh, to function well in that environment which is absolutely not Aristotle says one of, of, of having a rule book of actually being able to it's not a skill in the same way that making tables is a skill or something where you can control the materials in a controlled environment um, and uh, we've through kind of modern science become kind of accustomed to the idea that, that here's this here's this split again between you could take this kind of Aristotelian idea and go yeah society is complex like this even though we've had a lot of social scientists to try to figure out kind of what the rules might be but society is complex like this we understand that kind of ethics and ethical and political dimension but of course nature laws order linearity predictability there it's a different world and so we, we can just have scientists who do that for us and that, that's okay um or what sarah is pointing to of course is that we, with our recognition today of the of the, the complexity of physical processes non-linearity and the rest that actually that's a false distinction and the, the complexity of managing the social and political world is very much like ma- the complexity of managing a or, or functioning well within a within a physical material world, and we need to think about these two things um, in a connected way. I mean, to a certain extent, I mean, you don't you don't you never want to drag it all back to 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 entropy, but you know, man- managing. It. Managing a country, managing a state, uh, is managing different forms of. I mean, you could even say, you know, social, social entropy. You know, the the, yeah. the collapse of societies, just a uh, kind of form of, you know, natural order. Yeah. Um, well, uh, one way in which the one step that you can take from this, so when, uh, from uh, those ideas, is is. Uh, kind of back to because we mentioned it a little bit earlier on but um, the idea of contracts and and, and uh, could just because there's something we didn't really talk about the idea of contracts very early on it was kind of touched on in the in the sense sort of in the context of atoms combining and forming regularities conjunctions and that that uh, was a kind of that's where you find the emergence of something that becomes law but it's not yet um, and it's a it's a term which um, contracts is a term which which said takes from Lucretius and then become it becomes quite an important term for him in, in a lot of his a lot of his work. Uh, another of his very well known books in English because it was one of the earlier ones to be translated is the Natural Contract, in which he lays out the case which he kind of again when you when you say this at least it kind of seems obvious but um he does it in a very interesting way and and i don't think it necessarily really was that obvious to people uh, before 
he lays out the uh, story of the social contract, which is in for, for kind of foundational for most good, most modern political theory, political philosophy, that there was a state of nature, whether we're reading Hobbes or, or Rousseau or Locke, uh, there was a state of nature, and then at some point uh, there was a, a, a contract signed to form society and in which we surrender certain freedoms in exchange for certain securities basically and, and in, in, in exchange for, um, for the rule of the, the sovereign over us but in a safe kind of more ordered sort of way and so you have the formation of, of a society from contract uh, and as Sayer points out that the, the whole story is one about leaving nature behind and uh, and of of signing a contract which excludes nature. Um, and again, following up on what I was just sort of saying a few minutes ago, he says we can no longer actually afford to exclude nature as if it is just some sort of outside, some sort of just some sink out there where everything could be uh, sent and chucked and forgotten because um, it can't. It's, it, it's rebounding on us very quickly and we're destroying the conditions of our own lives. Um, so you have the idea then uh, he suggests of uh, a redrafting this contract so that it is not a social contract but a natural contract in which nature is involved in the um, in the contract if we want to think of it in these terms that we that we recognize as as a kind of foundational moment in our own in our societies mm-hmm. anyway that that Kind of seemed to it follow on a little bit from what we were just saying about the helmsman, but also hooked back to something we were saying earlier on with regards to the atomism. It's, you know, it's interesting that you repeated that point that you know we need to connect with nature. Sounds very cheesy, but um, yes, <laughs> yeah. But you know, I guess I guess when Sarah was writing these texts, actually, the seventies was the clear split for people who were either extremely unaware of these things or extremely aware. So on one side you had people pushing information theory and believing that the world was um, going to the stars and this yeah. was the initial you know this was big initiation of this in the 70s but at the same time you had books like um, The Limits of Growth uh, and a couple of other texts of, uh, which were very clear on kind of um, you know limits there was the first time when kind of limits I think people people really don't like to talk about limits but this this notion of bringing nature kind of to the inside mm. and having that as something that that's along alongside everything else the natural contract as it should be is actually an extremely difficult way to think because and I'm, I'm thinking extremely contemporarily here of these recent um climate change protests which i think yeah have in my opinion and i'm going to try find a way to direct this so the, the question to bring out how say might kind of say how we do connect to nature but in my opinion they, they've kind of negated their entire argument from the off because the, the 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 all these protests have actually increased the carbon footprint you know they've they've yeah. there's been a massive production for them loads of driving yeah. loads of you know um stopping people using public transport etc etc and I, you know they as far as you know using these <coughs> utilizing these means to assess that situation they're addressing the problem of climate change, but still from the plane of mm. kind of comfortable um, yeah. industrial society. So they have a, yes. So that's kind of a practical way in which the uh, a common, quite a common, as far as I, 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 my opinion, uh, a common mistake is made with regards to actu- actually making that change. So how would say um, is is there some hint towards a practical? Perhaps not. Perhaps not too practical, of course. But ways in which we can perceive a way to to actually, you know, bring nature inside. Mm. Yeah, there's there's uh, it, it's a it's a it's a very good question because the, uh, there are it, it, it's easy to feel I think easy to take the view that his ideas are. Uh, one and the same time, very original, but also nigh on completely ineffective. Um, then, if if one takes the view that we are facing uh, um, 
a climate catastrophe and that we really have to like the like we're, the scientists are telling us, we've got 10 years, more than 12 years max to, to make some significant changes. Otherwise, uh, the differences, the, the consequences are going to be pretty, pretty dire. And kind of recalibrating a certain kind of relationship to the material world through our kind of rethinking about our our senses and our and thinking about cultivation of certain sort of ways of being or something just ain't going to do it really that's, that's just that's just kind of fiddling around the edges somewhere now i think it, it's a little unfair to take that view and as much as these ideas were developed by say kind of in the 1980s and the 1990s through the 90s when uh, perhaps uh, the quite the urgency of the situation as i think we face it today hadn't, hadn't become apparent um, but there are even so now, I think there's some very positive and very important things which he, which he, which he uh, says about the, the kinds of um, attitudes that could be cultivated by, by individuals and uh, rather than kind of large-scale social action and so on. But, um, but there are a, a one or two things he says that certainly could, I think, be taken up in, in this... Um, in this way, which is which are important important now, can be important now. One uh, you mentioned, uh, just simply finding ways working seriously to reduce carbon footprints, and uh, that kind of way of thinking is, I think, completely consistent with his thinking. Uh, and another, but but then we probably didn't need Sarah to tell us this. Okay, that's uh, sort of fair enough. Uh, thinking about the relationship between pollution and procreation, property, I think is is a really interesting one. That uh, I think you could you could be, begin to develop a, a a politics or a perspective on on politics and business and how it's conducted. Through from that perspective, from that perspective, from that angle, uh, and the other one I was going to say as well is just the the idea is as he's, as he's repeats in various places that that anybody who actually has a position of responsibility in ter- in terms of any kind of leadership uh, position, shall we say, and we don't have to only be talking here about prime ministers and presidents. Uh, should be kind of literate in <laughs> in science and in what's happening in in, in the material world, and uh, it's just not good enough just to say, "Oh, it's somebody else's problem." We'll you know we'll outsource that somehow uh, and expect everything to still be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just not good enough to be able to do that. So that there has to be a kind of institutional shift in in terms of the perhaps in terms of the organisation of institutions, but certainly in terms of the kind of expectation of their role and their remit and, their, and the kind of people who might be involved in them and what, what, kind, of, what kind of abilities these people should have. Yes. Uh, and it, it may be that that's something which could change surprisingly quickly. I don't know. Um, it may have to come from people's expectations as well as to what people will accept in terms of... Uh, people of of those institutions and the people involved in with regard to this view of the earth as our ship yeah uh, uh, and our our pollution is kind of a you know sole responsibility is this you know and this is quite this is very almost very new sarah actually because i think is it homo essences was published in english very very recently Oh yes, this like I love these even quite come out yet. But um the I uh, as I understand it, you know, the I know Times of Crisis deals on this. But this is these are these these latest works actually say has um, gone more from very macro thinking of you know communication and um <laughs> order and emergence. You know, he started with with the huge thing, literally universal physics, and he's now he's now getting down to 
the the subject you know the human um, mm. questions of human life in you know and time times of crisis itself as a you know as a title it kind of you know, it, it is a minor extrapolation on on i think how he sees the becoming of the subject within contemporary yeah. societies perhaps you could um yeah yeah um the uh, it's a kind of this is a kind of counterpoint i think to the impression that one can get sometimes that he is a little bit of a that he does kind of traffic in a certain nostalgia for a simpler life or something like that you know because uh, he's he's actually very he's we know that we've, we've, he's uh, steeped in science and he all his early work and you know, all his early life was studying science and mathematics uh, we know then that he became in part dis- disaffected with science because he because of Hiroshima and the terrible things that he could see science doing um, but he he's never become anti-science he's never become someone who's uh, uh, kind of just has a, a negative relation to it or he's not antagonistic to it uh, he's and he's remained fascinated with its with its possibilities and with the possibility of technology and to what, what technology can do and the the idea of of hominescence is, is that uh, that we don't yet know what humans can be and that because of our incredibly rapid incredibly rapid development of uh, technology we are capable of changing ourselves in ways that we as yet simply cannot anticipate and so uh he talks about this as as a form of exo darwinian evolution we've 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 kind of we've left darwinian evolution behind because we don't have to wait centuries for (laughs) slow evolutionary change or from the occasional jump where how we like to think of it um it's it's happening kind of almost almost generationally you know he's fine with this he doesn't think this is some terrible alarming thing that must be stopped or something like that this this is this is what where we are and and it's it's up to us to make something of it and um and to make something of it which turns out to be in some respects better or, or, or more sustainable or more pleasurable than than what it might be um, and um, there's a that's an open book for him really if, if unless there's any other directions you wish to take this in or other areas you wish to venture into at all uh, no, as you say we could probably talk for for hours about things but because there's I'm sure there's a lot of, there's lots and lots of things that we could uh, we could talk about but um, uh Maybe just the one thing, because I just do. There was just one one idea. It's just a question which you asked in the mm-hmm. in the, the previous time around, and um, I thought it was a great question, and I kind of sent me off thinking about it. About is is Sarah radical, or is would you call him a radical thinker? I um, think uh, I remember when I first asked that because I think. Um in relation to the time period as well. I mean, you, you know, take that question at place value as well, but in yeah. relation to the time period, it's quite strange that uh, in terms of all biography, you know, French continental in the 70s, he is next to all the, well, the majority of philosophers that we'd consider at the, at, at the end of the radical spectrum, you know, the yes. Lezen Guattari and Lyotard, and, yeah. um, uh, Baudrillard, you know, these are, these are well, who we, you know, these, these are who we'd think of when we think of continental radicals. And yet, yes. Sam, maybe, he, he, is he kind of a somber, a silent, a silent radical? Mm. Yes. I think it's a really interesting question. And, um, it's so. It seems so e- easy not to think of him as a as a radical, and in some ways, I think that's that's, that's right. It's it's not. It's easy to see him as not a radical. I think it's easy to see him as a, as not radical because he doesn't actually 
make a big show out of challenging things. Mm-hmm. He doesn't. Uh, he's not a. He's not an antagonistic thinker. He occasionally has rants about things, but um, he's not a, an antagonistic thinker, and he's not a thinker who tries to establish a position. And I think I think if you perhaps put it this, this way, this might this might not be fair to be, to be honest, but um, it might not be fair. But the thinkers we might associate don't think of as radical uh, spend a certain amount of time trying to clear their space. Can I say? No, you, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. This is where I'm standing. All right, I'm gonna, you're going to have to fight me off if you want this spot here. Right? This, mm. this is. I'm trying to stake a claim to a certain kind of position, yeah. and that's to some extent is done through through uh, kind of a, a, a kind of antagonistic relation to others. Uh, or it's done through a some more through a more kind of sympathetic way when you look at all the all the different books that Deleuze wrote on on, on Spinoza and on Bergson and on Hume and on, so but there are all ways of him saying okay well, I'm just kind of I'm, I'm establishing a certain kind of perspective here a certain position a certain sets of terms and languages problems which we're really going to make and then you're going to know kind of where I where I am uh, uh, and where I'm coming from here with this way of thinking um, and, and it's so hard to see that in there because he just he seems to move from one thing to another to something else so he's sometimes he's talking about he's just talking about literature and he seems to be in a kind of fairly kind of very much a local kind of way and about a particular idea in a particular text and then he's it never quite it's hard to see it kind of coalescing into this this uh, really kind of strong body of principles, which is going to start kind of forming this new way of thinking, you know. Um, and yet it kind of does, but it does so very discreetly and very indirectly. Yeah. And I think that's why you, you, it's easy to miss what is actually radical about yeah. says thinking. And so, yeah, I was going to say when you said there about, you know, um, people who, radicals who kind of say, right, I'm here, you know, if you're, and then, and then the left and the right or whatever of that position, kind of, then, then they can attack. Says kind of like, I'm here for a bit, I'm here for a bit. And, and everyone else is going, hey, wait, you know, and I think perhaps that's the more radical position of, yeah. and it, but it's, I think, I think the important thing to say there is that when he's saying, uh, yeah, this was interesting for, for a bit, it's not an apathetic, like, shrugging it off. It's kind of, yes. Like, but it's also not, a, simply a utilization of that just to get his own point across it's almost no. like um sure. like a wondrous kind of look around of that space and uh and uh but that's uh, that, that that then again sounds a bit too kind of sunday armchair philosopher but kind of amusing on that space just for the short time he's there and then bits mm. of that come in later and yeah it's kind of like um it's like his to get quite philosophically terminological it's like his mode of time, but rhizomatic. Like, you know, there's there's huge gaps between spaces where, that he's in, which he doesn't really breach at all, you know. Um, and, you know, there there is, in terms of uh, most kind of large, big, big philosophers, if you, you know, whatever, um, usually at least tackle the, the big key themes, at least subtly at certain points. And for Sarah, there's... There's, there's big areas that he just doesn't he's just not there's nothing there you know there's no there's no real yeah I'm sure he's interested but there's certain areas that just don't come through at all I think but and this ties in with the next question I've got here actually so perhaps we can which is which is and this this is the toughest question of, the, of them all really which is how to approach reading Sare yeah and yeah it's, it's a, a horrendous question <laughs> Um, because I, what I was going to say yeah. actually when it went yeah. on, on about him leaping from point to point is yeah. he, he he also consistently almost I don't really know if he's ever commented on himself being called a philosopher but I get often got the impression that I mean of course we can call him that of course we can but there's there is at times like a push you know not towards a novelist or not towards a poet but there's times of poetry there's times of prose oh, yes. And 
you know, there's there's times when you think, well, this is this philosophy now, or you know, you know, it's a completely, it's it's a real uh, assemblage of a lot of things. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, philosophy was his first real love, or perhaps after mathematics, uh, but. Um, he had a troubled relationship with philosophy because he um, there was a kind of thing going on in in the in the, the kind of the politics of intellectual life in in Paris within academic institutions, and he he didn't get a he didn't get a philosophy position, and he got uh, offered in the end, and it, it wasn't immediate, I don't believe, um, uh, a position at the Sorbonne teaching history, right? and um, he felt really uh, annoyed about this for a very long time i mean he he, he was in the philosophy department originally because he was he, he knew michel foucault very well and when foucault was invited to set up uh, the university of Vincennes, he, he say was joined him uh, there at Vincennes, although that was a very short-lived experiment and um, say i think was one of the early ones to to leave to be honest um but um yeah, then he didn't get that kind of established position in, in, the, in a philosophy department, which he was expecting. And I think he was really, uh, he got that hurt, that hurt. So he, he kind of was obliged to, to, in a sense, to think in a different way. So he was thinking, he was working in, in the history of science, he's working in history, but he's, I'm sure he would have been anyway, but his work uh, was, was um, you know, the, the engagement with mythology and literature and uh, so on, many things, art and so on. Now, uh, later, I think, actually, in some ways, it became a, a kind of, he made a kind of virtue out of this, in as much as he became very disillusioned, very negative about the 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 academic philosopher writing enormous books with many footnotes uh, and uh, regarded that as a kind of redundant model of writing, really, and of thinking. Uh, it's just so incredibly defensive and um, not creative enough, not inventive enough at all. And so his, his way of writing and thinking is, is very much about um, invention. That includes these... these, these uh, the invention of uh, the connections between things, so that you, be, that he, that, as we've said earlier on, that certain figures that you find in in science or in literature or in, or in a particular philosophy or in information theory, whatever, then become ways of thinking that you can translate elsewhere and uh, and um, see operating in ways that maybe you hadn't anticipated. So what this means then, in terms of the, your question about how to read him, is it's, it's, it's difficult because a lot, a lot of his work is really not systematic in the way that we think of systematic philosophy. It seems to be kind of charting this often mad, unpredictable path uh, of its own uh, around. But there is, there's, um, you know, there's always... Uh, a method, if we think of it, think of it in those terms, in a sense, a kind of way, uh, not 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 always an established way, but an invented way that he's that he's charging between these things. It's not as um, it's not just as playful and inventive as sometimes it might appear on the surface. Um, but to read him, it's, it's it's it can be difficult because you you can jump in almost anywhere and get. A sense, and then um, of what, what he's doing, but it's always a very incomplete sense about what he's doing. And then you can jump into another book or somewhere else, and you it feels the same and yet very different because he's it's, it's he's in a different place talking about a different problem, perhaps using different kinds of operators and figures to do so, uh, and so trying to piece this together into a bigger not a whole but as to use an image that he likes himself a kind of patchwork or <laughs> sort of tattered patchwork of uh, scraps of fabric kind of stitched together uh, it's, it's not it's not easy um, it's not an easy thing to do so my my only recommendation in terms of uh, a reading Sarah is to 
start with anything that looks interesting. Uh, in, enjoy the, the, the writing because he is a, an extraordinary writer and a quite unique writer, I think. Recognize that that writing is really part of the part, whole thing. It's not just a, a kind of decorative exercise. It's not just that he's fancies himself as a bit of a not a poet or something, but it's actually the way that he writes is very important for his thinking. And um, don't assume too quickly that any one perspective that you picked up is the key to the whole thing, because <laughs> yeah. start somewhere else and then um, and then add that to it, and then start somewhere else and add that to it. But and if that sounds a little bit like uh, it could be a, a long process, and in, in, in a way it is, it's true. But uh, but it's a very enjoyable process. I think that's uh, a good place to finish. Okay, thanks very much, David. My pleasure, James. Thank you. It's been a a different conversation, but uh, another very enjoyable one. Thank you.